Hi, everybody. Pete Damaski from Bully Finance, and I'm here to discuss Module 3, which is a more in-depth look at the, the financial statements of a firm. So as I'm trying to get used to this myself, I hope that you're seeing most of the screen, which is a slide, but I mean, who the heck knows what you're actually going to see when it comes to, to how we manage things on this side. So, um, you know, I'm going to try to, um, you know, slide some things here and make things a little bit bigger for you guys. And uh, I think we're in good shape. So hopefully everybody's doing good and fired up about corporate finance and ready to go. So this is this is our third actual lesson. And this lesson here, again, it's not pushing the ball forward too much, except in terms of last module, we learned about the financial statements, right? Basic stuff. Now what we're doing is we're gonna take uh, the next step forward into trying to gather perspective from these financial statements. So I think it, I think there'll be some really good ideas exchanged in this module. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, um, you know, we're gonna establish a framework. And the one thing I have to say about having a framework for doing stuff is that if you have structure and discipline, it's easier to do, right? So uh, we're not here to reinvent the wheel when it comes to this stuff. What we're here to do is to show you how to gather perspective but perspective itself, you know, it's it's not imagination. It's not made up stuff. It is just how do I take what I look at and develop an opinion about that? And you can use a structure to do that. So that's what we're going to talk about a lot in, in this session. We're going to obviously see again the comparisons between two time series or three time series. So that'll be pretty neat. Uh, we'll dive into seasonality, systemic and idiosyncratic risks. Um, systemic is market risk, idiosyncratic is firm specific risk. We'll talk about the DuPont methodology, which stresses that framework for assessing the performance of a firm and level setting. And then we'll do an impact assessment and along all those and overriding everything should be a consistent view of risk. So let's plot forward. So in this in this slide here, you know, we, we, we reiterate the idea of standardization of an approach. And the one, the one thing that I'm always concerned at about is how do you level set something? So, you know, I think I'm going back to Investments 101, and hopefully you guys have had Investments 101, where I look at my return. And I could have a return of 10%, or I can have a return of 5%, and someone would say, which return is better? And there's no answer. Okay. But what I try to do is I try to look at it return per unit of risk. And if the 5% is returning that level with a per unit of risk, let's say it's half of the 10%, then it might be a good thing. And again, it's all judgment, but it allows me to look at things on what we call an apple apples basis. So that's that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be doing apples to apples or apples to some fruit similar to apples. So we can go ahead and uh, you know develop these perspectives with with some type of commonality between either the time series, the financials, the firms, etc. And the one example I would bring up right now, and this is common to everybody, comparing mark to target and when I teach MBA programs, I remember there was uh, there was a student group that did a comparison of Walmart and Target, and I can't remember the figures right now, but I would definitely say that Walmart sales is probably at least twice as large as Target's. So you start off with a sales level twice as large. Then you look at the balance sheet and you see to your, say to yourself, okay, how many stores? What's the brick and mortar? What's the inventory? What's the total level of assets that Walmart has? compared to uh, Target. So it's really tough to start off and just compare the two firms because it is that Target's doing what they're doing with their assets. Walmart is doing what they're doing with their assets. So we have to have a common common size. Um, the surprising factor was you throw into the big retailing mix, at least in the United States, you throw in this third party, which is Amazon. And you know, Amazon sitting out there, they really don't have a lot of brick and mortar, but they are making a big impact in the sales levels. 
So what we have to do is we would throw those in. So let's do a three threesome in terms of a side by side analysis. So again, what we want to do is is start off with a basis of an equal comparison. So this is where we talk about the common sizing of these financial statements. So down here at the fourth bullet point, sub bullet points here say that I can take an income statement and I can say, okay, you're right. The income statement is not the same actual nominal dollar value or nominal currency value period over period, but it is the starting point. And I'm going to say that level is 100%. Okay. And then I'm going to go down through the rest of the income statement and whatever I'm left with is going to be my profit margin, my net income. And for me in the U.S. here, that's going to be, hey, listen, I have a dollar which constitutes 100 cents. And whatever I have less than that represents some cents. So if I have a dollar sales, what does the firm walk out the door with to give back to their shareholders in terms of their net income or profit margin? Same thing with the balance sheet. The balance sheet, you can take the total assets or total liabilities and equate them to 100% and, you know, look at the balance sheet and that effect. So actually, the, the next two slides, I think, are actually pretty good. And I see my dog's just going to get ready to bark. And this is going to infuriate me. Nicest dog in the world, but he has such a loud bark. Welcome to Pete's life. Okay, so my daughter and wife just went out for a walk, and I'm sure he's going to bark at him when it... they come back home. Okay, so needless to say, we'll get through it. So here's an income statement. And this income statement from Coke is actually quite dated. Okay, it's year over year, but it's 209 to 210. The reason why I picked this one out is because on Google Images, it was just it was one of the first images I saw. And I'm saying to myself, this is what I want to present to the class. So you can ignore the dates. We're not talking about, you know, any anything particular in terms of the actual performance of Coca-Cola. But what we can see here is that we've restated the the income statement, which by the way. I think that this income statement is a beautifully presented income statement for me to get a view of the firm, right? So unless you're digging deep deep into Coca-Cola, my guess is that this level of, of knowledge about the firm should be just about enough to make some type of perspective or educated assessment of Coca-Cola. But what we do here, just like I said, they start off with net sales. Now we can look at this and you know, I'm gonna benchmark this to be about 31 to 35. So it looks like net sales is up a little bit over 4 billion year over year. So if I'm if I'm comparing that and then I'm comparing well if if my sales are up I would expect my cost of goods sold to go up and they they did indeed by 1.6 billion but what does that mean to me in terms of the percentage is there any way that I can state you know, listen, if I'm doing more business, I would expect myself to need more inventory if I'm actually selling a physical product. So in this case, what you do is you look at the percent and you can look at this and say, OK, hey, cost of goods sold is relatively near where it was last year. And I would say that's 30 basis points more, three, three, three tenths of a percent. But you know what? Cost goes up. And if you wanted to do the next level down, you can pull out their annual statement or 10Q or 10K. And you could actually figure out, well, what's the costs that are going up? Is there a mix of costs going up and down? Is it labor costs? What what what's driving Coke's costs? No, I'm sorry, not the cost of goods sold. Expenses are down below, but the cost of goods sold. What causes that to go up? Did inventory cost more? Did sugar cost more? Did uh, aluminum in cans or plastic or whatever it is? The gas prices for shipping the Coke in their trucks. What 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 actually? Well, that one being cost of goods sold, actually. Piece on the count. I look at my gross profit margin, and the gross profit margin is about the same. So that's steady. So you look at Coke, and you'd say to yourself, okay, income statement wise, you know, they're bebopping around, and it's it's a pretty good year. I still don't know what what drove my sales that much higher, but it, it's it's definitely good, and the margins are about the same. Selling at admin expenses up a little bit. They might be marketing more. They might be having an advertising campaign. Okay, other, the percentage went up. It more than doubled, 2.3 from 1.0. 
But you know what? This represents about $500 million. And I know for me and you, 500 means a lot, but for a company that's selling 35 billion, okay, 500 million may not be that big of a thing to worry about. I would I would try to understand what's going on with this. It might be a legal thing or no. It might, yeah, it might be a legal thing. Okay. But anyway, in any event, the operating income comes in. This is the, this is basically what you take home after you pay your expenses and you know, at least some of the selling and admin expense. And right now you can see that they're they're a little bit lower here. And it seems like this would be a function a lot of the other operating expense and a slightly lower gross margin. Okay. We go down to interest expense, which is a function of the debt that the firm went in for. Now, this level of debt went up $350 million. Okay. And it more than doubled the interest expense. So this tells me the firm is becoming a little bit more leveled, levered, although the amount is certainly not out of control. This one here is one, and I actually did try to do some research by going out to their annual reports, and I wasn't able to come up with an exact answer of why the other income uh, went up. And, and to be honest with you, this line item here, if you're just looking at this, this is the real reason for the change. Okay, it's the other... Because again, our net sales went up probably a pretty good percent, right? But it really is this other income that really it, it just sticks out at you. And this is like uh, $5.5 billion, billion. And you can see the impact of that is in on income before taxes. Overall, this then skews, okay, the profit margin, increases that profit margin tremendously. So, Again, I just I just rattled off some things and and somewhere down the line that becomes noise. I understand that because when I'm sitting in a report where the firm's management is going down through their annual results or quarterly results, it's 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 the same thing. It becomes noise. Now I just rattled off five, six, seven, eight, nine things. And this is the same thing you hear when you're listening to the, the annual report or the quarterly report. But what you try to do is you try to get some ideas as to what they said. Okay. So here my cost of goods sold went up a little bit and the profit margin is squeaked. Okay. Now this isn't significant, but again, if I'm a banker, if I'm in different sectors, that would represent a tremendous squeeze, right? Okay. Other income is down uh, and other other operating income is down, other income made a difference. So from what I would suggest to you guys is, is it really look at this in terms of the level and the trend and to think think to yourself, why would this be the case? And you, know, you can eyeball this and it doesn't take more than 30 seconds for me to just come up with some type of thought that, okay, wait a second, you know, I have to be able to explain a firm that made $5 billion more in, in net income. How do I explain that? And then, then what you do is you size the firm to yourself and you say, okay, so it might be a sizing thing. Maybe if Coca-Cola got bigger, they could actually turn that around. This in and of itself is an interesting kind of comment. So then we go over here to the balance sheet and the balance sheet itself, year over year, you look to see the balance sheet. The balance sheet went up, okay, tremendously. It went up. Okay, 20 is 68. It went up almost $25 billion as a balance sheet. What is going on with this with this balance sheet? And to be honest with you, this is, you know, I look at this and I'm looking at the mix. And the mix is a vertical assessment of what's on the balance sheet, right? So the mix is, okay, hey, cash is 15% here. It's 19% here. Okay, accounts receivable, 6.1 here, 7.7 .7 here. Okay. Long-term investments dropped off. Plant property and equipment went up a little bit. Intangible assets went up tremendously. So what is going on with this, this firm? So this is a type of stuff that you would look at, but what I'm telling you is that for the income statement and the balance sheet, the balance sheet, I just made the total assets to be 100%. And then I can look to see. And one of the questions that we're gonna ask ourselves is that, how is that 
array of assets working for me to generate money, to generate returns for the shareholders. So here's, here's basically what makes up Coca-Cola year over year. And the question is, is that this intangibles, it, it, it's another part that I was, I actually went out to the annual report in 2010, and I'm just doing a search on intangibles. I didn't find a reason, so it might be a quarterly kind of thing or whatever, but at the end of the day, we're, we need to talk about current accounting, not 10 years old accounting. Um, but the bottom line is, is that we can look at this and we really should be looking at to see what is going on. And I'm looking here, retained earnings went up tremendously. Common stock stayed about the same. So let's look at the long-term debt. This is what's going on. Remember, back to the prior page, I think I saw their interest expense. Interest expense went up, right? By almost $400 million. And the reason why is because their long-term debt went up about $9 billion, okay? So this is what happens when a firm goes in for debt, their interest expense. So it does impact the income statement as well, okay? Now, this slide here is something that, you know, every once in a while you look at something and you say, this is a valuable thing, but I, I, I don't like the exercises that I see in textbooks that describe the DuPont method. So what the DuPont method does, and this comes down to the final bullet point on the right-hand side, it takes a combination of the balance sheet and the income statement to say this corporation combining the impacts, okay, of the balance sheet and the income statement, okay, work together to create a return on equity for the shareholder. So if I look at this bottom formula here, this says return on equity is equal to net profit margin, which is an income statement, okay, times my asset turnover, which is basically a combination of income and my balance sheet, times equity, which is a balance sheet item. So we have the impact across the board of the income statement and the balance sheet. And, and the probably where I like to go and my thought process is, is that I'm looking at this second column from the left, okay? And I'm telling you, okay, listen, I need to be able to focus and get a picture as to these three variables, okay? What is my profit margin, okay? And I'm looking at my profit margin and my profit margin is equal to my operating income, which is sales, minus my expenses, right? Now here they're saying plus, but if I look at my operating income minus my operating expenses, plus my non-operating income, which is normally de minimis, in these cases of some of these firms, the bottom line is, is that the returns that I generate are a function of my ability to take $1 of sales and translate that into the ability for takeoff. So this is where, you know, if we take a step back out of the DuPont methodology and I say to you, what is the focus of someone in corporate finance okay senior managers middle managers of the firm and at the end of the day sales minus expense equal income and there's a two-prong attack number one increase my sales if i can't increase my sales i look to the reduced cost because that profit margin is a very important point to make value which is a return on equity for my shareholders. And the return on equity is what? The return on equity is the capital gain in the share of the stock from time zero to time one, as well as the dividends that I receive. Plus the fact we'll have some intangible benefits from my environmentally and socially responsible management of the firm. But it does come down and it says here, we're talking profit margin. Right. And at the end of the day, we, we can break out profit margin into these components, but it still is profit margin. 
Then we look here. So this is my income statement and my ability to turn $1 sales into some cent return that I come back through the door with. Then I look at financial leverage. Financial leverage is my use of debt in the market. And we know quite clearly from accounting, from corporate finance, that what does debt do? Debt is leverage. And that's the reason why they use that word leverage. And I drew a picture and I don't know whether I put it out here or not, but it's a stick figure using a lever. And what does a lever do? A lever, if you set it up right, allows you to put X, X amount of force on one end of the lever and create more force on the other end of the level, depending lever, depending on where the fulcrum is, right? So I can use a board and a cement block to raise up a back end of a car to take a tire off the car if the board is long enough, right? So let's not let's not go there because that's just fun Pete stories. But leverage, but leverage is dangerous too. Leverage when times are good are very good for the firm. Leverage when times are not good represents a fixed cost. And I'm back to my example of thinking about me raising the back of a car up with a board, which we actually did. And it'd be dangerous. The board, the board actually snapped and cracked me in the head. But that's a downside risk. And then we look at our asset turnover. How do I manage this balance sheet? How do my assets turn over? And at the end of the day, you know, you can use a grocery store as a classic example of that. So you walk into the grocery store and the fruits and the vegetables, they have a shelf life, right? And actually, it's very funny because I think they're trying to extend the shelf life of stuff like lettuce and some of the stuff that probably, you know, would have a shelf life of a week. You know, they're pouring chemicals on it, sunbeam on it, doing whatever. You know, it gets shipped in freezer trucks. There's a lot of stuff that gets an extra week out of that, out of that uh, fruits and vegetables, right? But I can tell something from my asset turnover. And then I look at my other stuff inside the grocery store, like the canned goods. The canned goods really have a shelf life longer than a week. So maybe I should buy enough canned goods to put on my shelf that would last a month and, and rotate them through like that. This is the way that all businesses have to work. How fast your inventory goes through. And by the way, if you wanna take this into investment banking, what we're looking at is we're looking at what it what constitutes what we call a prop book of an investment bank. And a prop book is that book that that bank manages for its own use. So when we talk about a trading bank, the trading bank has inventory that moves in and out very quickly to meet the needs of the customers in a trade. We kind of get a little bit queasy when the prop book is a little bit too long in time or the, the the trading book becomes a little bit longer in time and then you start thinking to yourself well maybe the bank is looking for a move in the price and they'll take advantage of it themselves but that's prop book trading book but it also comes down to asset turnover and it impacts the investment bank the same as it impacts your grocery store right so what we're looking at over here in yellow is that dupont sets a framework if i look at these factors, if I look at these factors in terms of profit margin, leverage, which is debt, the use of debt, and the, how I manage my asset turnover, I can be able to generate a picture of return on equity. Now, the fact is here is that if we extend ourselves over to the right, look at all the things that we have to consider. And I'll just go down through now here. Financial leverage is just the amount of debt. We kind of already talked about profit margin, but let's look at asset turnover. Uh, asset turnover is a function of operating income and my total assets. Total assets are equal to current assets and fixed assets, longer term assets. And what I do is I look to see how do I manage my inventory? How do I manage my accounts receivable? And how do I manage my uh, um, cash and equivalents? Actually, I have to say that this reminds me of a story that my cousin wrote, and he wrote a book, and it was about inventory. Now, you're thinking to yourself, wow, Damaski, you must be massively famous. You can Google Damaski, and you can look for a book called Don't Double Bread the Fish, and it's a comedy book, but it's about his restaurant, 
And what he was trying to do is he was trying to extend the shelf life of fish that he made up by double breading it. And it didn't work. And subsequently, he went out of business. <laughs> so it, I, I'm laughing at it myself. It, it was, I don't think I ever read the book, but I do know the story quite well. But in any event, this is how firms manage themselves. Okay. And if we set up a framework for evaluating this, then we know the touch points of being able to intelligently talk about, hey, I see the asset turnover at Walmart is much quicker than it is at Target. So what, what goes in behind the scenes there? What causes that to happen? Is one better than the other? I don't know. Okay. So here's an example of, uh, I, and I kind of like this one. This one isn't, this one isn't as involved is what I would, that you would say, well, this is something that, I, that we should sit here and talk about forever. But look, look to see. Now, in the United States, there's two car companies, two tire companies, and Michelin may not even be a U.S. company. Goodyear, they're from Akron, Ohio. I think that they're still a U.S. firm. But these are two tire manufacturers in the globe. And first of all, you would look at that and you would say, well, which firm is the better investment? Which firm is run the best? Well, look, the profit margin is larger at Michelin. This means to say that from $1 of sales at Goodyear, they take home 3.7 cents. $1 in sales at Michelin, they bring home 6.8 uh, cents. So it's not quite twice as much, but it's substantially more than Goodyear does on $1 of sales. As a matter of fact, it's 84% more. So then we look at the asset turnover. And the asset turnover, and this is quoted in times per year, right? So if you take this and you solve for the months, Okay, Goodyear has an asset turnover of uh, 0.94, and here is 0 .89, 0.87. And so what we have is we have a situation where, okay, Goodyear is turning over their assets a little bit quicker. Okay, so at the end of the day, does this matter? These are almost similar, right? So I can't say that any difference between Goodyear and Michelin is based upon the asset turnover. And again, I would say to you, if you look at any store like a Walmart, Walmart actually, ha they probably have fairly quick asset turnover in most of their units, most of their, most of their uh, departments in the store. So obviously they have huge food, the food should turn over, the clothing turns over. Walmart turns over a lot of stuff at a very low profit margin. And the fact is, then you say, well, is that good or bad? Well, they they have to depend upon, okay, uh, having consistent inventory being delivered to them because if their turnover, if their turnover of inventory is so is so high and fast, then they have to figure out, listen, they're reducing their storage costs, they're reducing their insurance costs, they're reducing their utilities costs because the inventory is not sitting in a big warehouse. It's showing up at the stores. That might be a good thing. However, they do have to order it and manage it, and there's a lot of stuff with that. So there's a lot of stuff that you know we should just be thinking about um, when it comes to asset turnover. And then here's the debt. Now this is really significant, right? The financial leverage. Michelin uses way less debt than Goodyear. So the mix of the profit margin, profit margin. Okay, let's reiterate this one more time. Revenue minus expense equal income. Expense includes your interest expense. If Goodyear is more in debt, they're paying more interest expense. So this could help explain why Goodyear is actually has a profit margin that's significantly less than Michelin. Now, the fact of the matter is, is that here, here's what we hadn't done. We haven't yet looked at what is the sales of Goodyear versus Michelin. In my book, in my mind, I think Goodyear is the number one tire seller in the United States. And I don't think Michelin is. Michelin, on the other hand, might be a higher end tire where they're actually able to gross, gross it up more than what Goodyear is selling their baseline tires. But over here, this tells us a little bit about what each one of these factors are. And I think that 
And what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, paint a picture that, hey, the return on equity, the return generated for $1 shareholders equity is 13.9 for Goodyear and 15.1 for Michelin. Not too different from one another, but it's based upon a model that Goodyear sells probably a lot of volume, a lot more volume at lower profit margins. They utilize more debt in their capital structure. Michelin sells less but higher end tires at a bigger margin and uses less debt. And at the end of the day, they produce similar amounts of return for their shareholders. This is awesome stuff because it helps me paint a story as to what's going on with these firms. We do this with banks all the time. Okay. So then I go into my coup de grace because I said to you guys, hey, listen, I'm going to try to study seasonality. So when I studied seasonality, the first seasonality thing that came up was, hey, skiing. And I'm thinking, I said, okay, let me, and, and there was one or two comments about skiing. So then I figured out to myself, okay, hey guys, let's walk the walk. Let's walk the walk. Now, let's not just talk the talk, let's walk the walk. In one of my prior clippets, I said that the investor's webpage is a great place to get some scoop. And lo and behold, I go out to Vail, Vail Resorts, and I'm trying to figure out, well, let's go out to their investor webpage. And I come upon an investor presentation that I think is dated April 22nd, 2021. Guys, you're getting the modern stuff here. This is real time. Okay. And so I'm just going down through this, this and it, it was a 60 or 70 page deck. And honestly, I took it as a self-marketization of Vail. Now, let me take a step back and say, you know what? On the darkest, cloudiest day of any company, you can look at their uh, presentations that they give the street to the equity analyst, to the debt analyst, to the general public when they give their earnings. And it's always a sunny day at these firms because no firm wants to just come out and say, hey, we really had a terrible quarter. We messed up. We missed the mark. We didn't do this. And no firm is going to come out and say idiosyncratically that it's on us. Okay, even uh, even some of the big banks that recently got uh, hit with Archigos. Okay, and this is public, right? So this is, this is the, you know, you can go to Google, you can go to each one of these banks' annual websites. But the fact is, is that what these banks are doing is they're saying, hey, we had a great quarter. Q1 is a great quarter. Unfortunately, we got dinged by this family hedge fund that wasn't able to pay its bills. And, you know, we had a lot of their collateral and we had to sell it at a loss. And some of that loss actually impacts these banks dramatically. And it is what it is, right? So, but but look at, okay, I'm, I'm back to painting a picture. Here's a job opportunity for you guys. If you guys are great at marketing and you're great at getting out of trouble, then I think that it's a great opportunity for you to be, go into investor relations at these firms. Because as I said, it's always a sunny day. So right here, okay, they're telling us Season to date. Now they're talking this, the skiing season at Vail. And one of the things about Vail is that they own probably 20 or 30 different ski resorts, of which I'm not a skier, but I have actually heard of like at least 15 of these ski resorts. So they're massive in the United States and they're massive in Canada, massive across the world. So this is a good thing, right? So they focus in on, first of all, and I'm just, I'm pointing out some of the things that I think is funny. Past sales. Okay, North American season pass sales increased 20% in units versus prior year and exceeded expectations across destination and Epic Day Pass. So I'm looking here. You can go down to the uh, you can go down to the footnote or the whatever that is footnote. I guess that would be, and they're going to go ahead and they're going to tell you exactly what the difference is in the time period. We don't really know. You know, this might be a new program that wasn't kicked off totally in 219. So again, in 220, it has to be better. You know, if they sold two of the things, 
I'm going to shut the recorder off real quick because someone's coming in the house and the dog's going to be barking. I'll be right back. Thank <laughs> you.